Hey, John. Hey, Craig. So for this interview, you uh, went into the city to meet up with Peter Shankman, who started this company called Harrow. How'd it go? Uh, I did. And um, <laughs> Peter is the interview that almost didn't happen. First of all, props to my wife who set it up. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Camille. <laughs> Thanks, Camille. Um, but yeah, I got so I got to Peter's office. I think the interview was at three o'clock or so. I got to Peter's office, waited in the lobby for 10 minutes or so. And Peter eventually comes out to to get me and he comes out. And like, he's got his head in his hands. He's clearly uninterested. He's, I, I forget what he said. So I'm like, what are you here for? No. <laughs> it's like, oh, man. oh no, this is the interview. that's not going to happen. And we get in and we start doing the interview and like, it's very rough. You can tell he's got other stuff in his mind. Luckily, once he gets talking, his story is awesome. And he really, really gets going pretty quickly. But his story is really like, his story is to me kind of the pipe dream that everyone wants and very few people can achieve. So Harrow is, a, it, Peter will tell you about the interview. Uh, Harrow uh, stands for Help a Reporter Out. It basically connects journalists who are looking for sources for stories to the sources themselves. Um, so if I wanted a story about small business owners, you know, I could put a request out on Harrow and someone who runs a small business or is part of a, I don't know, chamber of commerce would 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 get back to me. Uh, that's the website. And he started from his living room, him and his cat, <laughs> uh, just sending out uh, emails. <laughs> And within a year or two, it was making over a million dollars in revenue with almost no expenses. Like this business was him sending emails and eventually a website and eventually a small staff. But he had over a million dollars of revenue in less than two years with that, you know, with a good idea and his own personality. So really neat story. He now is kind of a, he does a lot of things now. So he's, he's actually got a podcast of his own. It's called Faster Than Normal. He does a lot of kind of speaking and consulting engagements and such. He um, he sold the company, by the way. Uh, he sold the company two years after founding it. Right. For an undisclosed amount. <laughs> um, That's my favorite number. A favorite number, yeah. But um, <laughs> but he's but he's very outspoken nowadays yeah. about ADD and ADHD, which he's been diagnosed with. And it's kind of, you know, he talks a lot, not just in the industry, but in general about kind of managing that and what it means for his business and what it means for... Mm. Uh, mm. kind of his lifestyle, what he can and cannot do. And one thing that's cool in the interview, I think it's a little bit unique to Peter, is that Peter makes himself very, very available. Um, he, in fact, makes himself so available that he, he he has his scheduler tell him what days he's allowed to see people because <laughs> if he didn't, he would just, <laughs> he would he would block off lunches and stuff and just lose all of his day. So he has two days a week where he can actually, you know, talk to people and, and do stuff like this. But, but anyway, he makes himself very, very available. Mm -hmm. um, and he has a lot of good advice about how to reach out to folks if you're looking for advice or looking for help or investment or whatever you need. Peter has a really, really pertinent perspective on that. And he shares that. Um, mm. And that was really cool to hear in this episode. Yeah, absolutely. I thought this was a super cool interview. And he gives you a really nice, honest perspective on his story. And I yep. think he's like, at points equally surprised by how successful things become. Yeah. And I like his, um, you know, he talks a lot about customer service now that's kind of a shtick. Yeah. And I, uh, I like how honest and simple he is in many ways. He'll just like, you know, you just have to be like a little bit above normal and normal is often terrible. And so he's just like a, yeah. a straightforward, no bullshit, fun dude. Um, so yeah, I really like this interview. Okay, cool. Let's take a listen. Eight million businesses around the world use MailChimp to send email newsletters. We are one of them. It's super easy. Even John can do it. So go to MailChimp.com and sign up. It's great. Yeah, dude. It was August 6th, 2008, mm -hmm. when a reporter from was Entrepreneur or Forbes, whatever, came to my apartment and wanted to interview me about Harrow. Yeah. And the article came out and it basically started with, you know, Peter Shankman has gotten up from an interview four times to answer his door because four different PR firms have sent him birthday cakes. <laughs> As they should, he's beloved by every PR firm in the world because he's changed how I'm like, holy shit, I got something here. Yeah, um, exactly. Kind of funny. And uh, for those of our listeners who haven't heard of it, what is Help a Reporter Out? Help a Reporter Out was, still is, I suppose, a website that changed how journalists and sources communicate. So uh, prior to Help a Reporter Out, it was difficult for journalists to find 
sources on deadline. It was difficult for uh, sources to get in the press. You have to hire a PR firm, the whole thing. It was a pain in the ass. I know a lot of people, and it occurred to me there had to be a better way to do this. So I started um, uh, sending out emails to my journalist friends saying, hey, I have a lot of friends um, who work in uh, PR, who do random things. I'm happy to put you guys together if that ever helps. And mm -hmm. um, journalists started taking me up on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that, that led to um, starting this website, Help a Reporter. Within a year, we had about 100,000 people. So we had, uh, God, we were sending out, at the end of a year, we were sending out three emails a day with 50 to 75 queries per email. So 225-ish queries a day. We were north, for the entire time that I ran Howard, we were north of a 75% open rate. That's on three emails a day. That's absolutely insane. I mean, the averages on emails like that are what, 5% or so? 10%? Uh, on a good day, yeah. I think yeah. the week before Christmas, it's up to somewhere like 6%. Yeah. That's incredible. And what's the story of actually getting it off the ground and running? I sent that an email. I mean, I wish I could say it was some <laughs> incredibly large thing, but essentially yeah. I had friends who, used to, who I used to get press for, yeah. for fun. And it grew up. And before we knew it, I had companies approaching me saying, hey, my PR person um, reads this nonstop, religiously, and um, said I should look at advertising. Uh, what's your advertising uh, policy? And I said, "Sure, okay, time to make an advertising policy. And uh, <laughs> I did that. And um, I think we started off selling... Uh, Three emails for like a hundred bucks, yeah. and realized way quickly that was way too low. And so, um, by the time I sold it, we were selling three emails a day at fifteen hundred dollars per email um, for a small three-line text advertisement at the top of the email. No way. And uh, well, you know, seventy-nine percent open rate. Right. You could charge what you want. Yeah. So when you started this, you were doing it for free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it was always free. Were you? Were you right? Correct. It were was you, always free. I never charged. But you weren't collecting, collecting any ads. revenue. Yeah, ad revenue. I, were you working I was doing at the PR. Time? Yeah, I was doing yeah. PR for certain clients and things like that. And relatively quickly, I realized that that the money was in Harrow, not in PR. And yeah, and plus, it was more fun. Uh -huh. PR requires pitching and yeah, you know, doing all sorts of things like that. Um, uh, Harrow was just writing pithy emails from my living room. Right. But you still had to do it three times a day. So how'd you balance that with your existing job? Within six months of starting Harrow, we I had no more clients. Okay. Um, within six months of starting Harrow, I basically gave up all my uh, PR clients, um, didn't renew their contracts, and focused 100% uh, on Harrow. Nice. It was pretty cool. I was, you know, never expected it to blow up like it did. Yeah. Um, didn't expect it to be as big. Certainly didn't expect to sell it and make a fortune. Yeah. Um, just thought I'd do something for fun and... and um, Maybe it would last a little bit. Yeah. yeah. But I think that's, that's, I think if you go into a business trying to, with the sole goal of making money, mm -hmm. and there's not a bigger reason for it, uh, whether it's altruistic or whatever, um, that's going to come back to bite you. Fair. Yeah. And which, were other people doing this at the time, or was it? There was a company called Profnet. Okay. They were owned by PR Newswire. Um, they did it, but their model was different. They charged PR firms, I think, like seven or ten grand a year, wow. um, to do exactly what I was doing. Wow. And the joke there is like, you know, they threatened to sue me. Yeah, and they're like, "You're stealing our queries." I'm like, "If a journalist gives me the same queries they give you, and we both post them, how am I stealing your queries?" Mm. You know, and uh, like, I'm like, "Oh my god, I'm gonna sue you! You're stealing my queries!" You know, and. <laughs> They didn't find that fun. Did, did you actually send them an official letter? No. Okay. <laughs> Do I, dude, Speaking I of lawyers. Shit, right? No. So for me, it was just like, I'm like, guys, if you want to sue me, I'm like, I, I, at the time I had like 150 members, right? They were friends. Yeah. Like, guys, buy me a steak dinner and a few martinis. I'll give you the 150 members I have. This uh -huh. is bullshit, you know? And um, I never heard back from them. And that pissed me off even more because I was like, wow, you just asked me out and then didn't freaking call. Uh, afterwards, you know, for follow. <laughs> so screw you. I'm building my website. Yeah. Uh, yeah, built Help Reporter, and it's a one page. I mean, it was literally a one page site. It said, um, it said. Um, I remember it was funny because I didn't ask for money or anything. I said, if you if you find the site useful, send a few bucks to Best Friends Animal Society. It was a, uh -huh. a place I was a big fan of, and still am. Yeah. 
And Best Friends Animal Society called me like six months later. And they're like, hi, um, we're just, um, we have a lot of donations. Um, I'm not sure how to put this. Who are you? <laughs> it's very funny. So, uh, <laughs> like in memory of Peter Shank, right, I think you're some like, like beloved uh, passed on. Thank you so much. They're like, did you have a cat or a dog named Harrow? Or I'm like, no, no, no. So, but uh, yeah, man, it was, it, was, it was, you know, I'm a big believer in karma. You know, I'm a skydiver yeah. in my spare time. And, and yeah. when you're a skydiver, I guess you kind of believe in good karma. You don't want bad karma hitting you like as you're about to open your parachute. So fair. I th- and I had a cat named Karma. Um, and so I think for me, it was really just about what can I do that benefits people? And oh, yeah, cool. If you do good things, you tend to make money out of them as well. Right. Right. Uh, so with $1,500 on an ad, um, what are your, and you're writing emails like, Res- are, roughly are 1.2 there, in revenue a year. Are there any, what are your um, expenses on them? I mean, you got a host of I had very a tiny of website and some folks. I had a tiny website. I had a lot of, it was a uh, mailing list. Uh, the the uh, mailer was a lot of money. Yeah. That was tens of thousands a month. But, okay. um, and then I had a couple of editors by the time I sold it. So uh-huh. it was very few, very few expenses. Okay. Um, yeah. Very few expenses. And you sold it fairly quickly. I mean, you sold it in two it years. It flipped in two and a half years, three years. Um, the largest advertiser was the company that bought us. Okay, nice. They, uh, I think they were just sick of giving me money. Every month. <laughs> like, let's we'll give them money one time. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah. And then for you, what kind of, did you plan to sell it all, you know? Never planned. I mean, I, I never planned to sell it. Yeah, it it occurred like... to me that it was definitely valuable. Mm-hmm. But for me, it was really like, I'm having fun here. Um, this is easy to do. It's getting my name out there. People know who I am. And I was enjoying what I was doing. Yeah. And so I think the reason it became sellable and the reason I decided to sell it was because I had I had two options. I could hire like 15 people and uh, grow it to the next level. But I suck at that. I'm a terrible manager. Mm-hmm. Um, my other option was... Um, just get rid of it. Let someone else do the stuff that I'm not good at. Mm-hmm. And my entire life is based on getting other people to do the stuff I'm not good at. You notice right. that to set up this interview, you never once talked to me about scheduling. Right? No, I talked to I'm not stupid. Megan, yeah. Um, I know that um, doing that, I will screw it up. The whole reason I hired Megan was because I had a speech in Singapore and I got to the airport to find out I had bought a ticket to Shanghai. <laughs> how did that? How did that happen? Did you walk in and? No, I they said, online. They told me I was going to Singapore, and I went online. And for whatever reason, I typed in Shanghai, and I bought the ticket. And I go into the airport, and I go to check in. I'm like, hey, where are you going, sir? I'm like, going to Singapore. All right, sir, this ticket to Shanghai. I'm like, right, I'm going to Singapore. They're like, this is a ticket to Shanghai. They did say like three or four times before I, I got it. I remember saying, I looked at the woman I'm like, well. Are they close? Can I rent a car? She's like, <laughs> no, sir, you cannot. <laughs> um, so that was like a three or four thousand dollar mistake, and that was when I learned. All right, someone else has to do this shit because I'm not. I know what I'm good at, and, and I know what I'm not good at. And a lot of that, I would learn later, comes from my ADD. Um, you know, my ADD is definitely a gift and definitely one of the best things that ever happened to me. Yeah. But again, it has to be managed well. It's like having a Ferrari. If you don't, if all you've driven all your life is like a Ford POS or whatever, and then you're given a, a Ferrari. Yeah. It's going to be a little different when you hit the pedal the first time, right? Yeah. But if you know how to drive it, you can go really, really fast and do awesome things. If mm-hmm. you don't, you're going to smack it into a tree. You know, again, you just learn your lessons. And I think it was it was a little trial by fire. I got very lucky. You know, Harrow was blowing up. I had money. Mm-hmm. Um, there was always an internet party that I was always invited to. And mm-hmm. I'm, it's, you know, I got very, very fortunate that, I mean, I, I like to drink. And so I would drink. And when the alcohol is free, uh, you know, I don't, it's the same way I eat pizza. I order. I, I know people who order pizza. They have two slices and put the rest in the fridge. It's they, they call it leftover pizza. I, I don't know what the fuck. Pizza. I, I, you're like me. It's a little hard to do. Yeah, it's you're like, well, it's there. Wine. It's just not a, not a thing. It's only eight o'clock. If I'm not hungry now. By ten Thank o'clock, you. for sure, I'll be hungry. Thank you. So you know, I my joke was I don't drink a lot, but when I have a drink, I drink a lot. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. I would go out and I'd, okay, we're going to meet for a drink. And I'd have, you know, everyone would have two drinks. I'd have seven. And I wasn't drunk. Yeah. I just drank alcohol the way I drink water, the way I eat pizza. It's that fast. So for me, it became very much about understanding myself and understanding my boundaries and understanding 
what I needed to do to make myself the best I could be. And was there a moment when you started managing that differently or has it been a constant It's been a constant progression? process. Yeah. Uh, it's about six or seven months ago, I quit drinking. Congrats. And that was probably the best thing I've ever done. Yeah. Um, and I didn't do it because, like I said, I wasn't driving into walls or shit. The worst thing I did right. was um, I, <laughs> the amount of domain names I bought while drunk was just staggering. <laughs> um, I must have like 500 domain names. It's like, what the fuck does social Velcro mean? You know? Yeah. But um, <laughs> so for me, it was, it was really about um, – just knowing that the changes I wanted to make had to come a certain way. Yeah. And so I quit drinking and um, I'm at the gym every morning. So essentially, I don't have the ability to moderate. So it's very all or nothing for me. Uh-huh. So for me, it's waking up. So I'm up by 3.15, 3.30 every morning. No way. Yeah. I'm either at the gym or out running. Like this morning, I have a, my best friend and my training partner, my running, my running partner. We've done Ironman triathlons together. Yeah. He's a public school teacher, and which works perfectly because the only time he can run during the week is super early. So mm-hmm. we meet at my apartment at 3.30 in the morning two or three times a week. Yeah. And we go out and we do six, seven miles, eight miles, ten miles sometimes um, before 6 a.m. Um, I'm also the asshole who got arrested in Central Park for exercising too early. Oh, there's Apparently, a rule about there that. There's a curfew in Central Park. And uh-huh. in, in UK. So I, I know there's a curfew, but I haven't run into anyone that got there too oh, early. Yeah. yeah. I guess it makes got sense. About, you know, and I'm like, dude, I get the letter of the law. It's don't be yeah. too late. I'm like, right. and she's, well, you're in there too early. I'm like, I was exercising. He's like, it doesn't matter. I'm like, would it, ma- it are you sure it doesn't? Because I think exercising, and I said this to him, probably not the best thing to say. Yeah. Exercising is a little different than giving hand jobs for crack. Yeah. So well, <laughs> I, I think we're on two different ways. I was very short. I got a summons. Had a fight. I won. It was an easy fight. But yeah. it's just one of those, you know, that that's one of the ways I manage my life. The other way I manage my, you know, you 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 find things that work for you, under the knowledge that at any given time, I am three bad decisions away, you know, three bad decisions in a row away from being a junkie in the streets, hmm. and so I am aware of what works for me. I'm aware of what I can do. I'm aware of what I can't do Mm -hmm. um my corporate speaking contract is very simple uh i will speak you will pay my travel and pay me except in vegas in vegas it says i will speak you will pay my corporate travel and pay me and client does not or speaker does not have to be on the ground from wheels down to wheels up for more than eight hours okay so i'll take a 6 a.m flight in new york i'll land in vegas at 10 30 i will um speak a land to 10 30 i'll speak at 12 30 i'll be back in a 4 p.m flight mm-hmm. because if i have to do a 6 a.m or an 8 a.m or 9 a.m keynote that means i have to come in the night before and me 12 hours in vegas with nothing to do won't won't end well mm-hmm. and i know that so i take appropriate countermeasures to prevent that you wrote an article um and i'm gonna paraphrase here maybe you remember better than i do but it was about how everyone has their vices whether oh, it's yeah. Yeah. coffee, it whether working out, or I mean, it ca- cafe, ca- was it co- cocaine, coffee, or cardio? Right, and yep. it kind of depends on your relative situation. Mm-hmm. It could be cocaine, but if you're in a relatively more you know stable place, yeah. quote unquote, there's no difference. Though. It's coffee, and I think that yeah, everyone <laughs> has you know their own vice, whatever you know, however kind of relatively, uh, however that's relatively seen. Everyone's everyone's got theirs. Do you think that that's kind of? Um, do you think that that's felt more acutely for someone with? ADD no or for yourself? Not. Really? The difference between, I mean, ADHD and addictive personality is literally like a molecule away from each other. You know, yeah. I, back in 2000 as a PR son, I took 150 CEOs skydiving. It's the first time I've ever gone. <laughs> and you got 150 uh, to go? Yeah. 149 Whoa. of them jumped, had an amazing time yeah. and never needed to do it again. I jumped, got addicted. I yeah. now have 460 something jumps into my belt. Mm-hmm. You know, um, that's why... I don't drink right? because I don't have the ability to go out and have a drink. Yeah. It's God forbid if I ever did Coke, right? I mean, <laughs> just, that's just, uh-huh. I cannot, you know, it, I would start and I'd probably like eight days later, my heart would explode because I wouldn't have stopped. So I, I, <laughs> yeah, I think everyone- I'm smart kinda... enough to know what to do and what not to do. And I'm smart right. enough to know, you know, there's a reason I work out. There's a reason I run. There's a reason I do all this stuff because I know that um, I have to control my brain in a certain way. Yeah. And how does that apply to your uh, your your business life now, your work life? Um, I tend to make impulsive decisions, not in a bad way. Sure. I mean, my impulsive decisions have made me a lot of money. Yeah. Um, but I have trust in certain people <laughs> to tell me whether or not this is a good idea. You know, I yeah. like being magnanimous. I like helping people. So my the first thing I'll do 
is, um, you know, someone says, hey, can I pick your brain? Sure, happy to do it. Right. Let's have lunch. My assistant says, you don't want to have lunch with them. Because if you have lunch with them, that's going to be half your day. You're going to be pissed off. Take five minutes on a Skype call. Mm -hmm. So she, my assistant only allows me two days of interviews and calls a week. Today's one of them. Nice. Right? Yeah. The other three days, I'm writing. Um, and when I'm on a plane, I'm writing. So for me, it's about being, again, aware yeah. um, of positives and negatives and using them accordingly. Yeah. So I want to talk about what you are doing now, um, but let's bring it back to Harrow for a second. So as Harrow started blowing up, um, it seems like you uh, found yourself doing a lot more of these speaking engagements and consulting engagements, et cetera. What was the... I guess what was the progression of the relationship when this started happening and 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 what it grew into now? Um, so everyone asked me, it's what you're asking me is how did I go from giving free talks to getting paid? I suppose, yeah. And the answer is very simple. You start asking for money. Mm -hmm. It is very hard to ask for money because you're afraid, oh my God, what if they don't have, if they don't want to pay me, then they won't hire me to come in and speak and I'm missing that opportunity for exposure. Exposure has never paid my mortgage, not once. Mm-hmm. And I saw a great quote the other day. It was someone gave a speech and he said, um, here's my speaking fees. If you're for profit, it's 7,500 bucks. But if you're nonprofit, it's 7,500 bucks. If there's a lot of exposure, however, it's 7,500 bucks. <laughs> and it just kept going down and down. Like, you yeah. know, and I mean, I, my, my fees are higher than that, but at the same principle applies. You know, at the end yeah. of the day, if, if people are, if someone's making money off of you speaking, why the fuck isn't it you? Yeah. You know, and it's a scary thing to ask for, but you need to do it. Yeah. You really, really need to do I it. mean, you're the one at the center exactly. of it providing the and value. You know what? If they can't afford you, well, if they can't figure out a way to pay you, yeah. not my problem. You know, Mary Goodfellas, fuck you, pay me. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's what it comes down to at the end of the day. <laughs> and, and, and I say that not, yeah. not being a douche. Right. I say it because you need to, you have a value. Yeah. Whatever that is, it might be 10 bucks, it might be a million. Yeah. If you go less than that value, mm -hmm. you are diminishing your opportunity to make that value again. And that's a stupid thing to do. Let's circle back to Harrow for a quick second. Uh, I I think that, you know, what I noticed with Harrow is that number one, uh, it's useful. And number two, it is genuine. Mm -hmm. I think we've got so much stuff online that you can have really, really great ideas. But, you know, we've got a couple hours online, quite frankly, and you know we spend some of it on Facebook and some of it on LinkedIn and some of it on our Gmail, and we just run out of room, basically. Well, it's funny. The biggest thing about Harrow for me, yeah, was that I was when everyone when I sold Harrow, I found out the company that bought it from me actually went and interviewed thousands, like I don't know, five hundred thousand of the current members who use it, the readers. Mm -hmm. And they, one thing they all said is that yeah, we Peter's like totally honest and we love him. And what I realized is that. You know, if you look at all the emails you get from like corporations, like United Airlines sent you an email that comes from do not reply at unitedairlines.com, right? Interesting, yeah. And they said, you know, we want to know how your flight was because we care, but don't reply to this email. <laughs> it's oh, true. It. Yeah. You know, my whole take was always, okay, um, every, I was sending out 750,000 emails a day. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them came from Peter at Shankman.com. Yeah. That's still my email. Yeah. Right? So when you had a problem with the Harrow, you know what you did? You replied. I mean, the week before Christmas, I had to delete 1.4 million emails every two days out of my inbox for that word, um, out of office replies. Yeah, which sucked. But every email came from me, and so when you had a problem, you just replied. I was the boss, I was the CEO, and yet I spent 90% of my day replying to emails because yeah. that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. So you make yourself very, very available, mm -hmm. Peter. Um, so I, I think about this sometimes. Question for you. If I'm a small business or I'm just a person who wants knowledge, advice, et cetera, and I want 10 minutes of someone's time, someone who's very busy, like yourself, mm -hmm. what are some tips for someone that wants Do 10 minutes of time? goddamn homework. Okay. I had someone who wanted to pitch me for money. They wanted funding on a product, on a product they were making that complemented the GoPro camera, right? Okay. And they reached out to me. Hey, I want to talk to you about this project, Compass GoPro Camera. I'm like, oh, cool. They did their homework. They see I'm a skydiver and they want to talk to me about a GoPro camera. Mm. I get, I have the guy over. He comes to sit down right where you're sitting and he puts a, he puts his little product down. He puts the GoPro camera down. He says, Mr. Shanker, thanks so much for taking the time. I brought a GoPro just in case you're not sure uh, if you've never seen one in action. They're very popular with extreme sports enthusiasts. Mm. I'm like, <laughs> you, yeah. 
So not only did he not do homework, not only did he not know my original Twitter name was Scott Ever, not only did he not Google the most basic term, which would have been Peter Shankman and GoPro, which would have brought up the blog post about how my friend Nicholas Woodman, the founder of GoPro, oh, no. you know, made a fortune. He would have brought up the video that showed me skydiving as the first skydiver ever to skydive with a GoPro. Oh, no. Okay. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. I mean, I literally bitch slapped his way out of my office. I mean, you do not. Out of there. Come on. You yeah. know, and the problem, it was a good product. I would have funded it, but he was an idiot. Yep. How could I possibly trust you to take my money and do something good with it? <laughs> A five-second Google search cost you at least, at minimum, 50 grand of investment. Yeah, it's good advice. Uh, you wrote an article recently about being uh, so goddamn happy. Ha! <laughs> Not gave... today, but most days. <laughs> You're doing all right. We, it, so you gave an example of a flight today, uh, a yep. flight delay, where you said, like, instead of bitching about it and moaning about it, I mean, flight delay is probably, what, the worst, second worst thing on the planet? It is what it is. Um, you know, it but... is for some people. Mm-hmm. Not for me. I don't mind. Right. And you said, like, I'll just take a walk. I'll get done with my, you know, emails a little bit earlier. You know, look, unfortunately, I work in an industry where I can always work. But the bigger picture isn't even so much, oh, I have something to do. The bigger picture is, you know, I'm going to make a giant list of all the things that complaining about weather, complaining about delays that ever solved. Okay, I'm done. Right? (laughs) Exactly. So, you know, if you want to be that asshole who sits there and complains, don't you know who I am? That's great. Knock yourself out. It's going to do absolutely nothing. Um, except get everyone on the plane to think you're an asshole. Yeah. And quite frankly, if I need anything from the flight attendants, I'm going to make sure that I'm standing behind you. Because as soon as you're done, all I have to do is go over and not yell, and I'm the nicest guy in the world. Mm-hmm. So, and, I, and it happened to me in, in Dubai. I was flying home from the UAE, and the, there was a... Um, what the was it? There was a... The, 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 the gates didn't open until like two hours before the flight. And... You couldn't print out your ticket unless you were at the gates, but you couldn't get into the gates with two hours. Before. So basically, anyone who showed up early at the airport to like shop or whatever couldn't get into the airport unless they had a printed out ticket. And so the guy next to me, guy in front of me, is like, this is bullshit. This never happened in America. I'm on a United flight. This should be... And the guy at the gate is like, wow, you know, I really have the power and you have none. It might be smart to be... Nice. The guy, didn't, you know, didn't even hear a thing. Ah, oh, fuck you. And he leaves. He storms outside. Ah, Dubai. Dubai. And I'm up. <laughs> and they, you know, the guy at the gate is like, and how may I help you, sir? I'm like, yeah. okay. Uh, I don't even know if he's American. He might be Canadian. Um, I'm American. And I just want to say we're not all like that. So I don't have a ticket either. But you know what? It's cool. Yeah. I'm going to go hang out outside. Absolutely no worries. And I'm sorry he was such an asshole. I don't know him. But we're not all like that. I just apologize on behalf of them. Nice. He's like, not the problem. Most people are really nice. Go see my friend Farid. He's at gate three. Tell him I sent you. He'll print out your ticket. Ah, that's awesome. I was inside the airport <laughs> hanging out in the first class lounge, chilling for like three hours. And then the, I see the guy walk in. It was like yeah. 30 minutes before the flight. And he comes in. He's, he's sweating his ass. I was, I'm like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my passive aggressiveness knew no bounds at that point. But oh, yeah, I was like, dude, just had you not been an asshole, you probably would have gotten in too. Yeah. People you know? spend a lot of energy on it. What lot. the hell? For yeah. what, man? You know, no amount of guilt is going to change the past. No amount of worrying is going to change the future. Just li- we only have to just live in this moment. And I don't want to sound like all hippie Buddha Zen, but it, it's true. And it took me, it might have taken me 40 years to figure it out, but shit, it's true, man. I'll send you, um, I'll send you something that was really cool to me and, and, and pretty powerful. It was this, it was a formula. I tend to be very rational, so formulas work for <laughs> me. Um, but it was uh, satisfaction equals expectations minus reality. No matter where you are and what situation you're in, you'll find folks that are happy. Love but it. what you're not going to, what what you find across the spectrum as well, are folks who are unhappy, not just because their expectations are so high, right? And they're not meeting them, and that leads to a <coughs> level well, of dissatisfaction. And you know what? So I, I wrote Zombie Loyalist, and the basic premise behind Zombie Loyalist is that we expect to be treated like shit in any customer interaction. Mm-hmm. Okay, we expect the flight to be delayed. We expect the the dry clean not to be ready. We expect the fast food to be screwed up. If you can just be as a business one level above crap, I don't even need you to be good. Yeah. If I could teach you to be one level above crap, you'll win 99% of the time. Go out of your way and be a couple of levels above crap and be good. People will do your bidding, mm-hmm. right? We expect such crap in in, our, in every expectation that the simple act of a smile. I remember I, I, my favorite story, I rented from Hertz and I, at Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport and I get to the airport and there's, you know, I had a gold, gold 
car, you know, gold membership, whatever, which is like having a Discover card. Anyone can get it. But it just means you don't have to wait in line. And so I go to get my car and it's mm-hmm. not there. Okay. So I go back. There's like a half an hour wait at the gold counter. They finally send me up to the main counter. Um, two hour wait there. Like two and a half hours, three hours later, I finally get up to the counter and the guy's like, how can I help you? I'm like, yeah, I have this membership. I have a gold member. Oh, you're a gold member. You have to go downstairs. I'm like, guys, you just sent me up here. I've been up for two and a half hours. Come on. I could see my reservation on the screen. Mm-hmm. No, you have to go to the gold counter. Sir, sir I know. I know you can help me. I, I believe it in my bones. You can do this. <laughs> He's like, nope. And he nexted me. He's like, sorry, I can't help you next. Uh, and I'm like, dude, I'm not anyone famous. Just don't next anyone. It's not cool. So uh, at Sky Harbor Airport in Phoenix, all the all the rental agents are, agencies are like right next door to each other. I walked 50 feet to Avis mm-hmm. where Phyllis, who worked behind the counter in Avis, who moved to Phoenix from Detroit because the weather was better f- for her husband Walter's asthma. She told me all this. Yeah. Um, had me in a nicer car for a cheaper price in like five minutes with a smile and she introduced me to Ramon Ramon is the general manager at Avis Phoenix and she introduced me like this she goes Ramon meet Mr. Shankman he's another Hertz refugee now I don't have an MBA but if your biggest competitor has a name for the people you fuck over on a regular basis you might want to work on that Mm -hmm. right what did Phyllis do that was so nice absolutely nothing she smiled yeah and did her job yep and I'm ready to like you know, give Phyllis a parade. Yeah. And now you're sitting here telling the and story. Tell, yeah. You know? And I yeah. always ran from Avis, never from Hertz. And that's the story. You know, yeah. it's not hard. It's not hard to be just a little bit better because the bar is so low. It's awesome. I mean, I usually get such a kick out of that. Usually you ask folks at the end kind of for advice for people aspiring to what you do. I mean, it sounds like be one level above crap. <laughs> so the day the day I sold Harrow, I walked back yeah. to my apartment. I fl- we announced in DC. So I fly back to New York, walk to my apartment. You know, I'm a millionaire, right? Mm-hmm. For a kid who grew up as a public school kid in New York with two parents who were teachers, this is a big deal. Walk to my apartment and, and I'm in the elevator going upstairs and I start to believe my own press for the first time in my life. I get mm-hmm. off the elevator and I'm like, man, I'm the shit. I got some money. Mm-hmm. I got all my humbleness went out the window, right? I, I walk inside my cat named Karma. Since passed away, but at the time, when I tell you she puked on the living room or the hallway rug, I don't mean like in a spot. You know, like at a football stadium when they go back and forth, they make X's. Like she must have spent like twelve hours just puking <laughs> back and forth in like an X pattern across the across the rug. Yeah. And I spent the next three hours on my knees cleaning up cat puke. Let me tell you, it's really hard to be pompous when you're on your knees for three hours cleaning up cat puke. And I believe that was the universe telling me, "Hey, kid, stay humble. You're not that great. You know, I can take all the shit away from you in a second. Your job, you've done well, you have to keep doing well, and you have to help other people. I don't have any magic formula. I mean, what I have is the fact that I believe that it's not that goddamn hard to be nice to people. Thanks, guys, for listening to that episode of Salt of the Earth. In our newsletter this week, we're a little bit tongue-in-cheek, talking about how Peter Shankman made his money by emailing his friends. Uh, it wasn't quite that simple, um, but if you think it is or you want to try, then the best place to start is going to be MailChimp. Uh, MailChimp allows you to send great-looking email newsletters to your customers, uh, great-looking newsletters like ours. Sign up is free at MailChimp.com. And also, while you are signing up for things, I'll let you know that we do this every week. We talk to interesting, gritty, small business owners. If you're into that kind of thing, then check out our website at saltpodcast.com and follow the link to sign up for our newsletter.